that you've joined us tonight. And um, I didn't get rid of that. Oh, there it is. There we go. And my name is Joe Dubs, and I'm Women's and Family Ministries Director for Georgia Cumberland Conference. And we've invited people from all over to join in. We've invited men too. Phil, I'm glad to see you joined in as well. And as you know, we've muted all of you as you've come in this evening. I'll explain that a little bit more. But for right now, just want to welcome you to this Zoom event, uh, virtual event, and to our Facebook Live friends, uh, thank you for joining in. We want to wish you um, just a special time here with us as well. And um, it's just going to be a fantastic evening here. And so I hope that you will just um, be with us as we work our way through this time. I hope you have brought a journal and a pen and your Bible with you and have some water and you're just comfortable so that you can just uh, sit back and enjoy the presentation this evening, um, but we want you to be a bit more interactive. Sometimes our Zoom meetings, you don't have an opportunity to be interactive. And so we wanted to change that. And so how are we going to do that? Well, let me tell you that I'm gonna walk you through this. So as you look at the bottom of your screen, do you see where there's a chat, where it says chat at the bottom? We are really wanting you to utilize that. So if you click on that chat, you can write to, to someone privately. You can just uh, scroll down um, when you click on that, um, click it on where it says everyone and you can write something to everyone. For example, if someone wanted to say who they were and write that in there, um, where they're from. So I would like for all of you to take a moment and say, you know, hi, I'm Joe Dubs. I'm from Calhoun, Georgia. You write your name and where you're from. Here we go. Hi, I'm Dana from Atlanta. Hi, Dana. You want to wave your hand, Dana, so people who can see who you are. We want you to try to use that chat right now so that you will get used to. Hi, I'm Ida from Savannah First. Ida, I have not seen you for a while. Can you there you are. Yes, good to see you. Very good to see you. And Ginger from Spring City. Ginger, can you wave your hand here? And so um, Barbara from Appison, we are getting a lot of people here. Just use it. And again, another feature with this chat is if you want to, Sharon from, uh, Sharon Harrell from Ottawa is on. Uh, Chris, Christiana from, uh, or Christina from Chattanooga from Ebenezer Hispanic, welcome. Barbara from Appison, welcome. So um, Jean M Mabuto from Uldawa, Standard for Gap Church, we are so glad you're here. And I know many, Tracy from uh, Temple, Georgia, we're glad that you've joined in. There's just a lot of you. And so continue to um, write. Mary Maxson, our speaker, said, hi there. It's a joy to be here. And so Mary is going to be sharing with you in just a few moments. And so utilize that chat. We want you to utilize the chat. Um, as you know, you're muted and you will remain muted during the presentation here tonight. Uh, and we will unmute you when we take you for, uh, into your breakout rooms. What I want to share with you now is that chat feature and so you're learning how to use that and continue to use it even while I'm talking here, just so you get used to it. And you should be able to listen and multitask here, okay? But these are some important uh, information that will help you enjoy this evening presentation more so. And so the other thing I would like to share with you is to the right of the chat, you'll see where it says, says reactions. Click on that reactions right now. And you can, so to follow along, if Mary or someone else is saying something and you like what they're saying, you, if you look in my box, I put a thumbs up. Um, if Mary says something that touches your heart, you can you know, put a heart up. If something is funny, you can put this up. So just practice that now. Put up any kind of a reaction and let's see how. How many reactions we can see at this time. I think fun. All right, on to that. You can use that throughout the presentations tonight, and um, I think that will be uh, enjoyable for for all of you to just another way for you to communicate and say yes, I'm tracking well. I'm tracking with you, Mary, on what you're presenting here tonight. And so uh, we want you to go ahead and use that information. Um, 
Also during Mary's presentation, during the presentation, she is going to be asking you questions and we would like you to respond to those questions. Well, you're thinking, well, if you're gonna have me muted, how am I going to do that? Well, this is how we're gonna use the chat. So Mary will be asking questions and they will go into the chat. And so if you have any question, she's gonna ask you a question. If you have an answer or if you have a response, put it in there. And I, I will, um, I will um, say or convey that to her, then I will communicate that to her and then she will give you a response. So again, just get used to using that chat. I wanna see some more chats. Heidi from Uldaway, glad to see you. Ida, glad to be here and good to see everyone. Yes, it is. Kath, um, Catherine from Tennessee and Tracy from Griffith, great. Um, so we're glad to see everyone. If I've missed anyone, um, I don't mean to um, in the chat here, but we want you to all uh, just feel very comfortable. Uh, Joy said, hello leaders, yes, and others. All right, at this time here, um, we have gotten our Zoom information and, and um, please utilize, if you see people on there that you would like to just say chat, private chat, and um, say to them, well, so good to see you, haven't seen you in a long time, go ahead and say that as well. And so if you are comfortable with that, if you have a journal and paper and pen, a water or whatever else you might be drinking at this time, if you do want to drink something, just settle in. Um, and I wanna take this time to introduce our speaker, Mary Maxson, and then I will have prayer. I wanna share with you about our speaker. Mary was born in Memphis, Tennessee, and she's married to Elder Ben Maxson. Uh, she was born in Caracas, Venezuela, to missionary parents. They have two adult children, Laura and Benji, along with Katrina, daughter in love, and Benjamin, grandson. Oh, just oh, you, I just want to co host the Adventist Generous Prayer. Okay, and. Um, I can find you. <laughs> oh, are we okay. trying to get And Donna, you need to mute yourself, please. Um, sorry about that. Yeah, okay. Um, and then Joe, unmute yourself. We can't hear you, Joe. Thank you. I muted it there. Okay. So, so far, you know that Mary is married to Ben. They have been in pastoral ministry for 47 years. She's excited about being here tonight. And she has served and married very different capacities throughout her ministry life. Uh, she's done a lot of things for ministerial spouses. She served as a North American Division Women's Ministries Director for several years. She and her husband pastored the Paradise Church in California. She as Associate Pastor for Discipleship and Nurture. And she is actually certified in training for discipleship. And so we were so very excited that we could have her with us tonight. I want to welcome Mary um, and just do a thumbs up or a clap on your reactions. And then while you are doing that, uh, if we could then bow our heads for prayer. Father God, we thank you so much for this evening. We are excited to be here. We have so much to learn about discipleship and living in Jesus. And Lord, just ask that you be with each and every one of us. Help us to clutter, uh, unclutter our minds. Just open our hearts. Um, let our ears be open to hear from Mary. In your name I pray, amen. I want to send greetings to my dear sister. She has on her iPad John Holly. So it's a pleasure to do this when my family can be here. Blessed be the name of the Lord. There's nothing greater than for a group of people to come together and worship to God. I will share, I'm a person who loves to have fun. So I'm gonna start with my fun side. I know, know what it's like to have an event and to prepare for it. I know what goes into that. And part of that, we as women love to do something different or creative. And that is we get our hair fixed, 
we buy a new outfit or shoes, but you know what? You couldn't do that this time. So I'm gonna ask you a funny question. How many of you made your faces up before Zoom? Raise your hand. See, there you go. You've already saved some money. When you also have an event, I also know this too, you sometimes buy a, a, a new outfit. You see, we usually dress for someone else like the women when we're having a women event. So we're saving money and the conference is saving money on Zoom. But the part I do miss, obviously, is uh, the face-to-face. -face. Uh, before we start, I wanted to share something that um, we nor if we were face-to-face, I'm sure you recognize these. <laughs> I am a believer of masks. So I want you to know, continue wearing them, continue being uh, six feet apart. And I'm an advocate of uh, being safe. In a week and a half, I had classmates and friends about eight to 10 dear classmates, friends, and loved ones who died of COVID. Because of that, I know, Joe, that you have prayed, but let's just take a moment. Some of you may have a loved one or a friend or something like that that you have lost or may be sick right now in the hospital. Let's just take a moment and pray for those people and pray, thank God, for the medical workers and for all of those people who are helping us stay safe. Precious Lord and Savior, I just want to say thank you to all the medical services and all of the essential workers and everyone who tries to keep us safe. Then this pandemic, we've learned a lot and I will share a little bit of what I learned. And as we start this, I put this series in your hand because it's about you and not about me. In Jesus' precious and holy name, amen. Donna, I want to thank you for doing my PowerPoint. So we will start with our PowerPoint and I will try to look at the screen, but I also know you are to my right, just to be aware of that. My PowerPoint is right in front of me. So if I don't see a hand raised or something like that, that's what Joe is going to help me with. When, they, when you registered, Donna sent out something that looked like this. Mine is heavily edited, but it looks like this. They are notes for tonight. Um, I will go by those, those will be my guidelines. However, as a teacher, I've taught for quite a few years, different uh, third and fourth grade, just recently Bible class, um, the teacher always adds a few little notes. So in the PowerPoint, there might be something that you don't have. You can tap into us at, at the end of the seminar and we can give you the wording of it or where it was found or something like that. So in this presentation, it is possible I will have something that is not on these notes. Okay, Donna, let's start with our seminar purpose. The seminar purpose is to emphasize the importance of discipling for everyday life and ministry. You know, God was so, when Jesus was here and walked on the earth, he became one of us. And so we will follow his example. We'll be getting into that. To identify the key elements involved in discipling. What is a disciple? What does it mean to, uh, what elements and, and resources can we use? We will also explore ways to integrate discipleship into everyday life and ministry, such as how to pray, how to connect with Jesus, how to study the Bible, how do you make it relevant and how do you share your personal God story with someone? Michael Iaconelli is a pastor who was in Wairica, California. 
a powerful, powerful Christian evangelical, um, had a very small church, but powerful writing books. He had visited one of the pastoral workers meeting in Northern California Conference. That's where my husband and I pastored. And he has a powerful book called Messy Spirituality. You might want to notate that. It is a powerful book to read. It will mess, mess, it will mess you up because it did me. This is one of their quotes. Christianity shows itself most powerfully in the unnoticed life, in the inconspicuous servant, the unrecognized saint, the invisible disciple. And my friends, you may feel invisible. And it's even more so with this COVID. There seems to be more of that. So why is discipleship important? Just to let you know that asterisk, which hadn't come up yet, many of these materials are created by Ben Maxson, who is my husband. He has been on a discipleship journey most of his pastoral ministry life. And yet it was, he's always been in a different capacity, but the last 14 years, we've had the privilege of pastoring together. So the materials that I have, I always give credit where credit's due, are many of his concepts. I have integrated some of my comments into it, but I just wanted to give him credit. Why is discipleship important? So let's turn to our Bibles, to Matthew 28, 18. And as we're looking into the Bible in Matthew 28, 18, if someone has it very quickly, can you read verses 18 to 20 very quickly? Unmute yourself and read that scripture quickly. Matthew 28, 18 to 20. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the day. What stands out in your mind? Who is the lady that read that? I didn't see your name. I'm Ida. Ida, <laughs> tell me what stands out in this verse for you. For me? Yeah. Uh, well, number one, that uh, Jesus is handing down something that he himself received. He said, teaching them everything that I commanded you. So yeah. the authority that he's giving them to teach. Exactly. And whose authority is it? The Father. Exactly. Very important point. Someone else, what stands out in your mind in this verse? Very quickly. All three of the Godhead are included. Absolutely. Absolutely. The three are one. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to ask one more person. What, what do you see here is of most important to you? I see that it's a command from Jesus. Yes. As we study, thank you. As we study through this, you will realize that when God's presence is with us and in us, these commands will come natural to us because he is the one that does it in us. Okay, my the next point. Donna. It is natural result of integrated lordship. That and you can go on to number three. Integrated lordship means you weave in God's word with your everyday life. And I will share numerous stories how I do that. Number three, without 
discipleship, ministry deteriorates into manipulative performance. There were three of us girls in our household called the Holmes girls, H-O-L-M-E-S. We um, grew up with a rod, spare the child, spoil, you know, spoil the child, spare the rod. I'm getting that mixed up, that text. And the one thing is, I remember a lot, a lot of times on Sabbath afternoon, if we went for a drive or on a trip, we would take literature and we would throw them out the window. Um, and my dad would honk his horn when I should throw it so that it would hit the mailbox properly. When there was an offering call, you many times probably heard, oh, you really need to give because what are these children going to do if they don't get your money? This is what you call manipulative performance. Someone else trying to convict you of something that the Holy Spirit's job is to convict. Four, discipleship is a secret to and the desired outcome of effective spiritual ministry. Let's go to the next slide. You must be a disciple before you can disciple. Probably one of the most important concepts. If let's say you are in a special profession, you go to that profession to get something specifically done. Uh, I am a cancer survivor. When I go and to visit my oncologist who is a woman, I totally listen to every word that she does. That's the same thing that we're talking about as a disciple discipling a disciple. You have to be one before you can disciple. The reason I have part one and part two, part one is how do you become a disciple? How do you become a follower of Jesus? I never assume, I never assume that everyone understands and has the gospel of Jesus Christ. I never assume that. I come from you might have a relationship. There are many people that pray. There are many people that have a relationship, but do you know him as your personal savior? This is Liliana. And of course you see a date there. Liliana, two years before that came up to me. She was 14 years old and she said, Pastor Mary, I would like to be baptized and I would like for you to work with me. Unbeknownst to me, I never realized that one of the most powerful lessons that I learned is listening to her heart, not what she said. And this is something that I believe God has gifted me. And that is when we go through life and you're listening and you're walking beside someone, uh, some people call it mentoring. The difference between a mentor and a disciple is this. Mentoring is usually in a profession, um, a physical therapy, um, um, a, a professional of administrative assistance or a profession in um, a technical type of profession. You're mentoring, you're telling someone and sharing with someone things to do and how to do things. Discipling brings the spiritual aspect of, I need to know someone's heart as well as socially before I have permission to talk to them about, tell me about how you and God are connecting. That's a very private conversation. So you must have a social and a good relationship with that person that you can gain the trust before you can do that. Next slide.
just wanted to ask you before you put that up there. Thank you, Donna. Um, I want either in the chat room or raise your hand. And Joe, you'll have, I'll need your help here. When I say the word disciple, what comes to your mind? Ignore the screen, <laughs> okay? What comes to your mind? I want only a few words. What is the description of a disciple to you? So either in the chat room, and Joe, you can tell me what that is, or someone raise your hand. What is a disciple? Someone who shares the gospel. Okay. I see up here a follower. Yes. A learner. A learner. A, a, my question to the followers, who are they following? Good question. <laughs> yeah, we have a lot of followers. Yeah. Good, good, good answers. Christ. Authentic seeker. Authentic seeker. I like that. I like that. Absolutely. I go to Webster's Dictionary, and here we have uh, discipleship definitions. I love the first one, one who supports and adheres to another cohort, a supporter, an adherent, and of course, a follower. Next slide. Also, a disciple also nurtures, and they nurture to promote and sustain the development of a nurse, foster, cultivate, nourish. I probably learned discipleship quickly when I did associate chaplaincy. My husband was at the general conference, and he was uh, one of the ministry directors for stewardship and discipleship. And so he was overseas a lot. So I made the decision. I wanted to be involved in ministry. I had a prayer partner and Carolyn said, Carolyn Rawson said, Mary, I think you would be a good chaplain. So I prayed about it and I learned how to go through the chaplain associate, not to the CME, which is a a degree in chaplaincy, but I did it as associate. This is one thing I learned. Um, the gentleman that taught me was of Presbyterian faith, but the one thing that I learned, he said, Mary, you're not here to proselytize the patients. You're here for tender, loving care. A paradigm shift happened in my chaplaincy ministry, because that is the very thing that Jesus is about. He is there to be the tender loving shepherd and it's the Holy Spirit that does the convicting, not you and I. Uh, and, and I cannot emphasize it. I will repeat that over and over. You or and I are not here to be convictors of someone else. That's the Holy Spirit's responsibility. Discipleship means personal, passionate devotion to a person, our Lord Jesus Christ. Next slide. How do you describe a disciple? Passionately loves Jesus, maintains intimacy through devotional life. And we're going to talk about what is a devotional life. Um, integrates Christ into every area of life. I will talk about how I do that. Makes Christ the priority in decision. Actively shares Christ. How do you integrate Jesus into everything that you do? And I want to share a couple of stories here. I'll let that picture be. Now, I will have some fun pictures in here because when Joe invited me to do this, I had done a similar seminar 
to the Southern Union Conference, which is your union, and also to the North American Division. There are 58 conferences and 13 unions. And so we had many of the people there. So you may recognize some people in this. I believe this was one of the North American Division events that we had where our shared discipleship. What does it mean to make Christ the priority in all of our decisions? Um, I will just share this. November 8, 2018, Ben and I, been living in paradise. We had just recently retired two months before our retirement in January of 2019. I was diagnosed with cancer. Going through that changes your total life. And some of you may have already experienced that. You make a choice in your priorities and your decisions. So I made a decision that I chose to praise and worship God and my time with him, what you and I would call devotional life. And during that time uh, of my cancer, one thing that I had to realize is God created me in his image it was originally our plan to live forever and yet sin came in and i just happened to be a person to be touched by that disease i am able to um, minister to people that have been experiencing in a way that i never would have was it difficult absolutely you go through all myriad of emotions. But the one thing I learned, and I love what Eugene Peterson says here, discipleship is anything that causes what is believed in the heart to have demonstrable consequences in your daily life. Eugene Peterson wrote the message. The message is a paraphrased Bible. It is not a... Um, a translation. There's total difference between a translation and a paraphrased. The clear word is a paraphrased. It is not a, a, a Bible like a translation in Greek and Hebrew. So um, keys to discipleship. Accept the gift of salvation Focusing totally on Jesus. Friends, we do not focus on our behavior. Oh, let me get this checklist out. Now, have I done this? And have I done that? And oh, I forgot to do this. So I need to check that off. Quickly, um, I had a flashback momentarily. Jenny, Virginia is my sister. In our home, we had the Ten Commandments. And it was in the hallway. Every time I went by there, guess what? I would sit there and study. Of course, as a kid, you don't know what it is. And I thought, oh, I'm going to check all of these things off. I, am, I'm, I can do this. I can do that. By the time you get to the end, there's two or three you've all already flubbed up. You've already sinned. And then you think, this is hopeless. So I grew up a behavior performance. I'm not sure about you. But this is one thing that has been very freeing for me, that in this discipleship walk and the gift of salvation, which I will um, also have it in another place, focusing on Jesus Christ, exploring the word, accept God's will, decide to follow the conviction of the Holy Spirit. It is a choice that you and I make every day as to who I focus on. I'm not suggesting you do this. When I share a story, I have permission to give it the story like Liliana. I uh, just briefly wanna go back to Liliana momentarily because claim God's power promised reality is a powerful, is uh, revealed in this story of hers. As she, I talked with her, her mom and dad were going through a very ugly divorce. Her mother stayed pretty firm in, in God, spiritually 
they had grown up both an Adventist. Uh, the father was a well-known physician in the area and had different choices. And one thing that Liliana, when she accepted Jesus as her savior, and I watched the Holy Spirit with, work with her young heart, her whole countenance changed. The power of God just shone upon her. And the picture that you saw where I baptized her, when I took her down into the water and she brought up, I just have chills telling the story. Her face illuminated with the presence of Jesus. My friends, that's what happens when you and I claim the power of the Almighty. We act in faith and we move forward in God's will because he has done this for us. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, if you do not know who he is, I briefly Googled him. He's a German Lutheran pastor. He wrote a book, another wonderful resource to read. It's a modern classic on discipleship, the cost of discipleship. Powerful, powerful preacher on discipleship. When Christ calls a man, woman, he bids him come. And what's that last word? Die. This is a photo that I also had in my PowerPoints. So Donna and I had a little conversation in our former meetings. And you might know some people here. Uh, the, yes. <laughs> uh, this was in a meeting at, I think, Southern Union. But the lady that is standing up in the very back in red is Laura Smith. So, and Robin is up here in front to uh, Joe, I guess it would be to your right, to our left, is Robin. So, this just makes me smile. These are precious leaders who have a walk with God. Let's move on to our next slide. One thing I noticed in working with Liliana was this. She made a choice to choose God to change her life. She knew when she wouldn't do it. There were many times I have a series that I go through with different ages. Part of my responsibility as associate pastor was working with one grades one to six. But many times some of the girls, uh, teenage girls, wanted to study the Bible or wanted me to disciple them. And so I used different studies for them. But Liliana would ask very pertinent questions with regard to if God wants us and desires that we accept him as our Lord and Savior, why is it my dad cannot do that? Her other question was, how can I do it for him? She had a burning desire that her dad loved Jesus. A piece of her answer was, he had told her he probably would not show up at her baptism. He had some bad experiences in his spiritual life and in his church life. And he had made a decision <clears throat> not to come to church. So I started praying that the Holy Spirit would convict him to come. So as I'm standing there in the baptismal tank, I usually say a few things about what I have appreciated about them in their spiritual journey as we're in the tank. Because they usually open the doors there at the Paradise Church open the doors a little bit before I actually baptize them for the worship flow. And I said, by the way, Liliana, you need to look in the audience. Her dad came and sat the last row and tears started streaming down her face. 
and when I baptized her, they were mixed with the holy water that happens when you baptize someone. That's how the Holy Spirit changes hearts. The Holy Spirit empowers and changes your growth. I'm a different person now than I was a year ago. There's spiritual growth that you go through, and I will share a lot of that on part two about how we grow, the concepts of growing as a disciple, and what does that look like, and how you can kind of can, can, um, assess where you are spiritually. The Holy Spirit provides appropriate motivation for discipling. Probably the one text that is very important is 2 Chronicles 36, 23. Uh, 2 Chronicles 36, 23 to 26. So if someone could look up that scripture, 2 Chronicles 36, 23. I think it's very important that we uh, read that scripture. Second Chronicles. When you get it, just start reading it. 36, start with 23 and forward. Oh, that, that, I'm sorry. I think that's wrong. I think it's 26. Hold on. Sorry about that. No, it is Second Chronicles 36. I'm sorry, I have the wrong text down. I apologize for that. What it is, is God were Ezekiel. Ezekiel 36. Thank you, Jesus. That's how the Holy Spirit works. He corrects you as you're speaking. <laughs> Ezekiel 36. So 26. So if someone could do Ezekiel 36, 26. It reads from the King James. Okay. Um, a new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you, and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. Is it just 26? Well, start with um, 25. 25? Yes. Okay, then I will sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall be clean from all your filthiness, and from all your idols will I cleanse you, and a new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. I want to tell you what this text did for me. Because I grew up in a behavior performance atmosphere in my church, this gave me freedom like never before. It is God who works in us to do this. I have the New Living Translation, and I will give you a new heart. I will put the new spirit in you. I will take out your stony, stubborn heart and give you a tender, responsive heart. I will put my spirit in you so that you will follow my decrees and carefully obey my re regulations. When we read about obeying the commandments, God, that is the gift of salvation that God gifts us. He also gives us the desire to want to obey. It's not that, okay, today I need to obey and I need to do this, 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 this. Do you understand? Perhaps you did not live in that type of setting. I did. Four, when we help people open your lives to the Holy Spirit through experiences, information, and skills. Go on to the next screen, Donna. I cannot tell you enough how this text, which isn't written in here, is so powerful because it is who is the word I will give? Who is the one that is mentioning that? Who's speaking? The Lord. God, absolutely. God says, 
I'm going to give you a new heart. I'm going to put the spirit within you. When you lead your life from your own experience, when you say yes to Jesus, those are the things that give you the joy in life. Not only that, but it is the Holy Spirit that is given to you to want to obey. It is not, okay, I've got to think about obedience and think, okay, I've got to do this, this, and this, and this. It's an automatic result and comes out of your own experience with Jesus. Donna, the next um, point. Your personal testimony is the most powerful tool in discipling. And let me just say this here. And this journey of discipleship the power of Jesus and the power of what he does. I have been transformed by the renewing of my mind. I am a new creature because of him. Discipleship is a process. It's not an end or an, an end of an event or the destination. Discipling is what you do through eternity. We'll, when we get to heaven, the one theme I believe we will study the most is salvation. What does it mean for salvation? I want to refer back to personal testimony uh, momentarily. Um, God brought us here to Calhoun. Um, when I get to the prayer time, I will share more. My husband and I had to leave paradise because of the fires that firestorm. It's called the paradise campfires that happened in November 8, and we lost our home. We lost the church. All of the pastors lost their homes. And you learn things from a different point of view. What I learned as far as a personal testimony is I had to rethink what that house was to me. It was a place where there were anointings. We had many people to the home. We were a pastoral couple that we had a lot of people over and a lot of the leadership because we did training in our home. We had anointing. Ben has cancer. I had cancer. We had both anointings in our home. Um, there was time for joyful uh, tears, celebration, a mixture of all of that. And we lived there the longest we'd ever lived any other place. And that's 15 years. And when I saw that and go back to it a month later, it was hard for me to process the memories don't burn. It's the structure that burns. You see, God brought us to that place and it was a holy house as God brought us to this place where we all here and it's a holy house. But I have to remember that my personal testimony of when we had to evacuate to Modesto, which was three hours, it took us five to six hours to get there because there are 27,000 people in paradise and they all had to evacuate that day. And as I was going through the flames and almost burned my, the back of my hand on the, on the window, there was a mixture of emotion. There was a fear. There was a kind of trust. I couldn't speak. I couldn't sing. I couldn't quote scripture. The things that you tell people to do, okay, I did not do. I was silent. But what I knew in my mind, all I could get out of my mouth as I'm driving a car and following my husband was, God help us, God save us. That's the only thing that came out. When we finally evacuated and, and got to Modesto, I never realized the power of prayer of all denominations. We were in touch with many different people, all Catholics, Lutherans, Presbyterians, um, 
uh, in the neighborhood where we rented a home, people would see us and they said, you need to know we have been praying for you. And what is your name? We're going to have prayer meeting tonight. And can we uh, use your name for prayer? I cannot tell you the amount of love and prayers that came from the Parad uh, Modesto community. The personal testimony that is a powerful tool to let other people know that God is bigger than the Seventh-day Adventist church and God is bigger than any of us can only imagine. There's going to be so many people in heaven that I know prayed for us that as we went through that fire and we are going to have time to meet with them. Personal testimony is one of the most powerful tools for Christianity. And that is telling your story of what Jesus has done. What I learned through the fire was this. It is your faith and your family that are the things that get you through that type of tragedy. Let's go on to seven, Donna, or the next slide. We are pilgrims together on this journey, on this discipleship journey and continue. You don't have this in your notes. It's important for us to understand what were the characteristics, put them all up, Donna, that'll be fine. Uh, the characteristics of Christ, when he was here on earth, he prayed for them. I want you to think of someone right now that you might know, they may be an Adventist or they may not, someone. Uh, what I think of is God brought us here for a reason. There is a lady that I have started walking with. She's in a different community, but our neighborhood, the walking environment is a lot better than where she lives because there's a lot more traffic. So God has gifted me, Linda, and as we walk together, she texts me and let me know she, uh, when she's going to come and when we can and share. What I realized is during this COVID, it has isolated us. And so we haven't had the opportunity to share what God has been doing in our lives. Now, I do it, but I do it in a different way. I happen to do it on Facebook. I happen to do it in text. I happen to do it in emails. So when there is a way, I, there is always, there is always Jesus is my savior, my lover of my soul. He's my rock and my fortress because of what he's brought me through. Jesus always had the atmosphere of love, training of the disciples. They could help and encourage each other, counseling and praying together, each one's strength supplementing the other's weakness. Work would be far more successful if this example were more closely followed. My dear brothers and sisters, just let me say this. I don't know what your church family's like. I don't know the personality of your church, but I do know this. I have been in churches all over the world. Each church, each culture, each environment. But what melts away the culture differences, the language barriers, the differences is a smile, can't do a hug <laughs> at one time, a hug, just being. Um, my husband was ministerial secretary in the Carolina Conference. And at that specific time, he, we had a close, close friend of ours that was hit by an 18-wheeler, Roy Dunn. And I ministered to her. I, I never knew until later. I cried her tears. She was so devastated because she watched it happen that I cried her tears. Just your presence and praying that God's presence be there is a powerful testimony of the presence of Jesus Christ. Let's move next. This is all North American division picture and those are all the conference and union, you know, those are the union directors. 
how do we connect with God? So after the fire, I will just segue into this. This probably was the most difficult for me to do. Your mind is fogged. You can't concentrate. I um, had to trust God for this seminar because I'm still experiencing results. But God always shines through. And it's this segment, Donna, I know that the devil didn't want me to put in. <laughs> she helped me. Part of, I'm, I'm extremely organized. Donna and Joe may not know that. This is a different me. Because when you go through a tragedy, certain pieces of your mind are affected. And I would read scripture and it did not make sense. And yet I did it because I knew that God's presence would be there. So this section <laughs> I put in today. Thank you, Donna. And I know the importance of connecting with God is what you call your devotional life. Reading scripture and um the importance of that, the Holy Spirit, this text in John is what God revealed to me this morning. I, before I have a seminar or a sermon or a presentation, I spend that morning listening to Jesus. And this is what Jesus told me about the Holy Spirit. This is how the presence of the Holy Spirit speaks to your heart. When Jesus was talking to his disciples and he's getting ready to leave, John 14, and of course, John 17 is the prayer that he prayed for his disciples. But the power is in the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life. And it is that presence is what helps you in your mind. And because I had been struggling with my mind when I would read scripture, I could not remember it. I couldn't recall it. Certain texts would come and it's disappeared, as you saw, and yet God revealed it to me, okay? Um, what I read this morning is John 14, 16 to 18 is talking about, I will not leave you as orphans, I will come to you. Yet a little while in the world will see me no more because I live, you also will live. In that day when you know that I am in the Father and you in me and I in you, it was the Holy Spirit's power that helped break through that fog that I have had and it comes and goes. And that power is what sustains me through any and everything. So if any of you are struggling with an addiction or a sin or um, struggling with something you don't want to share with anyone, a secret, the power of the Holy Spirit can break through and can heal you from that. This morning, this is what the Holy Spirit gave me. These things, uh, that's 1425. This is John 1425. These things I have spoken to you while I am still with you, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said with you. And then that next text is peace. I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Scripture is the solidifies your relationship and the connection with God, and you get to know him more and more. This is a love letter that God has written just for you 
telling you, I love you, I love you, I love you. And spending time with it will transform your life. There's nature, circumstances led by the Holy Spirit, people of God, you might have friends, and then prayer. As we move on, how do you pray? And the next slide, Con how do you connect with Jesus as a friend? I pray scripture during the time that it, my mind was foggy. I would take scripture and read it, and that would be my prayer. When I was diagnosed with cancer, rather than focusing on my healing of, of the cancer, I spent three days a week in nothing but praise and adoration. I would praise uh, verbally. I sang or used to. <laughs> the smoke has affected my singing voice. I praise, I play the piano. So that is part of my worship. That's how I pray. I don't have one particular way that I, I do my prayers. The acronym ACTS on four, adore. Adore isn't thankfulness. Adoration is what are the character traits of God? And when I taught in Modesto uh, two semesters, the third and fourth grade, I told them and I said, go through the alphabet. So I'm going to tell you this because we're all children, <laughs> children of God. Okay. A, B, C, D. Use one word, an adjective to describe who God, who God is to you. Almighty. Um, so I won't go through it. And probably number five is what got me through and broke through the fog of my connecting to God. And that is my prayer journal. I was able to express when I was in church last week, listening to the preacher, this is an acronym that Jesus gave me. P stands for peace. You don't have this in your notes. P stands for peace. R stands for rest. A stands for assurance and Y stands for yield. And as I'm listening to the sermon and writing this down in my iPad, I said, yield. And I thought that is the bottom line. When you and I yield to the presence of the Holy Spirit, that's when something happens because it is his will being done, not mine. I know the time is coming shortly here. So I want to just briefly go through this. Bible study is one of the key elements of spiritual growth. Next, part two, I will go into, under, uh, into more detail how we grow spiritually. Prayer and Bible study. When we did an assessment of the Paradise Church, there was a way that we did that through a survey of all of our 1,400 members, all of the surveys that we did there in Paradise. And it gives you, and the core part of a growing church and personal growth is prayer and Bible study. Begin your Bible study. Ask the Holy Spirit to guide you. Before you even open your Bible, ask him to be with you. If I, I couldn't read the whole Bible through. When you uh, Genesis and Exodus or, or Leviticus are the three most read books. And when you get to the Leviticus, you want to throw your hand up and say, what is this about, right? Start with the Gospels. It's a story of Jesus. Matthew, Mark, Luke. I have it here. That is in your notes. The last three tap chapters, read them over again. And what made the Bible come alive for me was number three, John, the book of John. It's the last five to eight chapters. It tells you the story of Jesus, the reason that he came and his experience in the, uh, the latter part of, of his life. Psalms, that was my that's what kept me, my feet on solid ground and still does. Whatever I am reading right now, I am going through Proverbs, but I always end up with Psalms. For me, the, the Psalms is one that seems to ground me. David is all over the place. He's just like me. Okay. He will write where he is. And then all of a sudden, he will end up giving whatever situation that he is to the Lord. Okay, Lord, I give up. The enemies are, are 
are around me. And you know what, my friends? The enemy is found in depression. The enemy is found in busyness. The enemy is found in all sorts of uh, addictions, pornography, I name it all. Why? Because the devil wants to anesthetize our minds because he wants us not to focus on Jesus Christ, but focus on whatever we're involved in at the time, such as COVID. COVID, my friends, does not define who we are. He defines who we are, and he walks with us through that journey. That's one thing I had to learn. The fire, as a fire victim and a fire survivor, as well as cancer, and a cancer survivor did not define who I was. God is. But you will go through emotions Because the devil doesn't want you to get there to say, Jesus, I'm yours. I want to focus on you. Number three, you have it written down here. This is what made the Bible come alive. And um, this is be part of your assignment between this month and next month. I want you to try out a devotional time in order to see how that works. These are the three, uh, so, and it may be a story. It may be a Bible story. Study the Bible story, but either journal or think it out. What does the text or story say about God? What does the text say about me? Or what does the text say about me and my walk with God? This will change and transform that scripture text. Next slide, please. The gospel story, probably the most beautiful place I want to end, and that is... I want to leave you at the foot of the cross. How do I say yes to Jesus? And I'm going to make it simple. I thought I would have time, but I do not. Um, So that we read this scripture. This is also in your notes. If you want to take time to do this for your devotions, take the time. I am a sinner. Jesus died for me. I repent and confess. Friends, You don't ask forgiveness from Jesus. You repent and confess. He's already forgiven you on the cross. He forgave your past, present, and future. Thank you, Donna. Put them all up. Once I say yes to Jesus, he gives me eternal life. I have life and in him, the light of life. He wants you to have the abundant life. The Lordship, let God be God. The greatest joy is that freedom of allowing the presence of Jesus to shine through you. It's not something that that you're going to say, oh, by the way, I think I need to do it. No, he's going to do it in you. I have to take a moment here and read 1 John 5. And I'm starting with 13. And this is the testimony that God gave us eternal life. And this life is in his son. Whoever has life, whoever does not have the son of life, does not have life. Life is the person of Jesus Christ. And he says, I am here. This is who I am. Do you love me or do you not? If you don't respond, sin takes over. Lordship, let God be God. I am a new creature. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. In him, you have life. Friends, wherever you are in your journey, I just can't tell you enough that no matter what you are going through, God is saying to you, come follow me. And his disciples, when they were out fishing, the story of taking the net on the wrong side of the boat, Jesus never answers according to how he thinks, how we think it ought to be done. In your breakout sessions, I want you to think about your own personal life, how you can integrate God into everything. And I just want to thank you for this privilege and opportunity to be here and share about my best friend and my lover, Jesus Christ. 
as we uh, transition into breakout rooms, we want you to stand by because you'll be all going to different breakout rooms for about 15 minutes. This is your opportunity to talk and to share with those in your group. And then we'll come back here and Mary will finish up uh, with her uh, closing remarks. And uh, so stay for the entire time. Those of you that um, are going to different rooms, just hold on. We have a facilitator in that room who will be asking you these questions. So enjoy your time and we'll see you in 15 minutes. We'll see you back in the main room. Thank you. Join. Okay, we are here together in the main room, and it's good to see you all. Glad you're all on. Um, this, this is in the main room, and this is the group that will be recorded, so I just wanted you to sh know that ahead of time. The questions are all okay, so, but I like to um, just let you know that this will be recorded, just uh, in case you had wanted to share something more personal. Um, if you want that shared, it will be on the recording. But I'm glad you're here, and I see Kathy Benson. Kathy, welcome. And you um, all can unmute yourselves at this time here because we're just going to have kind of a, a question time. It's going to be more of a discussion. I'm going to be asking you some questions here, and we don't expect each of you to go around the room and answer each question. More so, we would do it as if we were in a small group sitting in my living room. We'd all be sitting around, and we would all just be discussing these questions here that will help us to understand our relationship with God a bit more. So if you can, um, can you all unmute yourself? Are you able to do that? Okay. Um, yep. So, <laughs> all right. So we're going to start here. Um, we have, um, let's see, some of them aren't here. We have, um, several of you that were on the list that aren't here. And then um, I want to know Donna, who, who is Donna here? Donna from Grace. Okay, very good, very good. And Bruat, what is, who is that? That's Sarette. Oh, Sarette, very good, okay. Well, if you want to uh, unmute yourself, Sarette, it's so good to have you with us. And um, and then who is PL? Pauline Lewin. Pardon me? Pauline Lewinson. Okay, we are glad you're with us here. So um, Mary is, is here. She's just going to listen in. She might give a few comments, but she said she just kind of needed a rest. Mary, we really, really enjoyed this presentation as we are hearing it. Yes. So we're going to start with the first question here. What have you learned about being a disciple from Mary's presentation? What have you learned about being a disciple that you didn't realize before? Mm -hmm. For me, it's, um, a lot of it has been just reminders and putting things into a nice setting so that we can it can make sense better sense um but i love the uh there was a quote that was read at the beginning christianity shows itself and i didn't get all of that but in just the quiet moments quiet things that's that's a powerful that was just a powerful statement just starting off just you know, so many people look and they're like, oh, I'm not the singer, I'm not the preacher, and I can't do this. And, you know, we do the spiritual gifts, a lot of us come up and it helps. And it's like, yeah, this is how we make it work. And um, so I love thank that. You. It's that yeah, thank you for sharing that. And I can tell that it resonated with you. And it's so true um, that um, we need to see how God is wanting to work through us and, and in us. And um, and does anyone else have anything they want to share? 
you can share more than once. Yes, Barbara. I like, uh, not, this, this is I'm Phil. Gonna, I'm going gonna to listen to Barbara first here. Bar Phil. Call on someone. Okay, we'll do Barbara and then Phil. Okay, I'm not a really passionate person, but I was uh, impressed by what Mary said about we discipleship means a personal, passionate devotion to a person. I passionately love Jesus. I love Jesus with all my heart, but I don't show that passion, as you know. <laughs> so I'd like to do that more in my life, show that I'm really passionately in love with Jesus. I like that, Barbara. You know, perhaps in this month's time before our next meeting, you could journal on that and pray to God about, you know, God, how do I bring this passion, you know, out of me? And um, I'm sure he will reveal that to you. That would be wonderful for you to come back and share. That'd be awesome. The problem, Joe, is that I'm going to be in Zambia when you have the next one. I won't be here. Well, I would appreciate if you want, you can email me at least and let me know. Oh, okay. here. So, yeah, Phil, you were going to share something. Well, I liked uh, particularly um, what was brought out in Ezekiel too, uh, also where it talks about taking away the stony heart of flesh and giving us a heart of flesh. So it's a heart of flesh, but one stony, which means hardened against spiritual things. And the other is, uh, I take it, uh, uh, the, the heart of flesh. Uh, it says, will allow us to walk in his statues and to keep his judgments and to, um, and to love others so, in a way that I think people will say, there's something different about this person. And, and that will in itself um, perhaps even offer the Holy Spirit opportunities to, uh, to talk with them. Excellent. Excellent. Can we hear from anyone else? What have you learned about being a disciple that you didn't realize before? Yeah, Sharon. I really like what she said about being a tender, loving shepherd and not the convictor. Um, I've given lots of Bible studies over the years, and I think so often we approach it from the wrong angle. And Mary, I really appreciated what you said. I resonated so much with your story because I also was raised in a home where it was rules, rules, rules. <laughs> And, uh, and I've struggled with that a lot, but I, I love the concept of the tender, loving shepherd, and then the Holy Spirit does the convicting. It takes so much pressure off of me. Go, um, you can unmute yourself, Mary, down on the left corner of your screen. Yeah. Okay, very good. Let me just say this. I'm sorry. I had. I was just going to sit back. Uh, I want to mention to you, when I was chosen to be a pastor, I told the Lord there are two things I do not want to do. You never tell the Lord what to do, but I did anyway. Well, I ended up working with teens and young, young adults, et cetera, and the vow that I made to God is if I was doing Bible studies or working with someone, I would never do the selling type of salesmanship on their soul. That had to be God's work. So in all many, 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 many Bible studies and discipling, the Holy Spirit always convicted the person to be baptized and when. I never said, oh, by the way, we're going to have a baptism at this time. I want you to think about that. Never did that in the whole 12 years of my pastoral ministry. I, I left the Holy Spirit be the Holy Spirit. And every time the person would be convicted as to when they wanted to and how that looked. And um, Sharon, we, I believe, 
and the rest of you that we usurp the Holy Spirit's position by taking it away from him. You know, Mary, and in, in what you said there, it makes me think of um, over the years, I've learned that when becoming friends with someone um, from an acquaintance to a friendship and developing that in doing a Bible study or just even meeting someone in the store, you know, in the morning, I'm sure all of us pray, okay, Lord, what are we going to do today? You know, and we're part, you know, I'm partnering with God and I, I hope that that's what you pray too. But when a person does that, I like what you said, Mary, that you let the Holy Spirit do the work. In other words, our approach is like Christ's approach then. There's not an agenda. There's not a hidden agenda because we don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. We don't know how this is going to turn out. It's just if God impresses upon you to pick up the phone and call somebody or to bring something to them or to visit with them, take them out to lunch, whatever, we're just a, we are to be obedient to that, right? And um, not, with not expecting any particular outcome, because that is like, you know, I'm just reiterating what Mary said, that's up to the Holy Spirit. And we are just allowing him to work through us to reach another person. And so I'm glad that you've said that. And it's really important. Anyone and I also want to say anything about question one? If not, I'll move on to question two. All right, question two says, which specific concept of discipleship did you learn and how can you integrate that concept in your connection with God? I'm going to read that again because it is a little bit long. Which specific concept of discipleship did you learn and how can you integrate that concept in your connection with God? Powerful question. While you're still thinking, I will um, kind of share with you what came to my mind, something that Mary said, that my personal testimony is my most, I mean, my um, personal testimony, or excuse me, my personal testimony is my most powerful story. I mean, my story is my testimony. And so it made me think as she continued talking is that my story will reach someone that your story would not reach and vice versa. And so it made me stop and think, because I'm thinking about the second part of this question, how can you integrate that concept in your connection with God? I'm going to start adding that to my morning prayer before I get out of bed. God, what in my story today will be a testimony to someone that might need to see you. You know, what in my story today, in other words, I'm, I'm asking him in living my life today, the day-to-day -day of, you know, what is it in my life that can be um, a word of encouragement or just a demonstration of encouragement uh, to someone else? And that will be a spiritual discipline. Because sometimes, you know, we are all little angels, but then when our feet hit the ground, get out of bed, we might be someone else. And, but I, I'm going to, I'm going to accept, yeah, I didn't want to say it, Mary, but I want to, I'm going to accept that challenge there for myself and, and just journal on it and see how it goes this next month. Does anyone else have a, an answer to question two? Uh, when um, Mary went over the Jesus discipling characteristics, I love that he just, um, one thing that we always talk about in our ministry is building safe spaces, places where people can come and feel okay 
whatever they look like or whatever they are and still have that inspiration to change and to grow. And so I love where it said Jesus discipling characteristics, praying for them, building an atmosphere of love, having a concept of God, the word of God, and intentional about relationship. I think a lot of times in our churches, we sometimes get lost. That relationship part gets lost because we have the word, we have the truth. And so Mm -hmm. building the safe spaces as Jesus did so that anyone is comfortable being around and then working on those relationships. Um, Somebody said the other day, it's better to be truthful than to be loyal. And I was like, okay, so truthful, um, you can be loyal to a person to a fault and they're, you know, they're wrong, but if we can be truthful, and I think Jesus was truthful in what he was, he was truthful and loyal, you know, his truthfulness built a loyalty, I guess. I like that. Joe, this is going to close in just about 20 seconds. Okay. Does anyone else have anything they want to say about uh, the second question? Okay, we're going to go back to the main room. Hopefully you had a great discussion like I, the group that I was in. Thank you for those to share. Sometimes we feel vulnerable to share, but um, I was also. Um, I have here on the screen something that you received in your email. Why do you think this is important? What I've realized is in my connecting with God, Sometimes we struggle with how do we do that? So this is a long assignment. In fact, I do this myself and I can, it can take a year. But as you see, the concept in this assignment is it really is true. And the question is, what happens to us when we accept Jesus as Lord and Savior? Go ahead and scroll it up. There are three ways that God sees us. For each um, number, it specifically tells what that gift is. And then it has scripture. So what I would like for you to do is just take number one, number two, or if you want to do a section, that's fine because there's the three segments. Um, At the bottom of this, I had it in my notes and I have it in here. The Bible came alive to me when I asked myself these three questions. So what this looks like is your time with God, connecting with God. I used to call it devotional life. And when I worked with a Mormon, she said, Mary, Gwen, and baptized her. She said, people don't know what that person, that devotional life is. So I've changed my vernacular to be inclusive. (laughs) So I said, call it connecting to God. When I talk to kids, I say, let's connect to Jesus. They grab that. They can gravitate. Whereas a devotional life is kind of this heavy. What is that? What does that look like? So this is your connection to God. Okay. Ways that God sees you. You pick a scripture. You journal it or you just think it, or you speak it out, and meditate on it. Think about that scripture. I'm looking right now on uh, his divine power, 2 Peter 1, 3. I could spend a whole week on that, writing down, what does the text say about God? What does the text say about me? And what does the text say about God and me, or my walk with God? Very important. So this is the beginning of taking these discipling concepts into how you pray, how you study the word and putting in it to action right away. So I just wanted to share that with you. In closing, thank you, Donna, you can take that down. In closing, the most important thing I wanna leave with you is God's word. I realized I had 
a reaction. So I need to take that off my screen. I'm sorry, that's been on the whole time. Oh, well. It, the more I praise and worship God, the more I physically praise him. I do not judge people with how they praise him. I've begun to pray with my hands up and I'll tell you why. I feel that is all of me when I surrender and I yield. So I'm going to leave you with scripture. The scripture is Ephesians 3, 20. Before I finish this, I am aware that there are some quotes and there are some things that I shared that are not on your sheets. The PowerPoint is available to anyone, Donna. Just be aware that um, who did the presentation? My name isn't important, just said I took a class and this is what it said. The PowerPoint is available if any of you would like to use it in your uh, a Bible study setting, a small group setting. Just because I worked at the Adventist Review for about four to five years, they always say give credit where credit's due. Not that, that it is me, but just let them know Mary Maxson did this presentation and this is her presentation. That's only the request that I would have. So I'm going to leave you with this verse, Ephesians 3, 29, uh, 30, excuse me. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Precious Lord, I leave each of these people that took time to hear your word, to feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit, that the passion of their hearts will be realizing that we're all sinners. You died for each one of us. I repent and confess specifically of what I have done. And I know that when I say yes to you, you are Lord of my life and you are the creator of our souls and you make us new creations. Even though I may sin, I'm a new creator, creation because of who you are. And I gift each one of them this scripture text that they realize that they are worth loving. Thank you for this time and for your power and your Holy Spirit in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. And all the people said, Amen. Amen. Amen.